السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين uh, Welcome back to our uh, live session of Tafsir Surah Al-Ma'idah uh, We are up to verse number 101 inshallah So um, with that we will begin بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تسألوا عن أشياء إن تبدأ لكم تسؤكم وإن تسألوا عنها حين منزل القرآن تبدأ لكم عفى الله عنها والله غفور حليم So this is a really really important verse because it um, talks about a human tendency we have to ask too many questions at times and to uh, delve into argumentation and uh, going back and forth So this is something that especially matters of deen Allah subhanahu has told us to stay away from. So the translation of this verse is as follows. O you who believe, do not ask of things which if made manifest to you would vex you. For if you ask about them while the Quran is being revealed, they will be made manifest to you. Allah has pardoned whatever happened in the past. He is all forgiving, all forbearing. Okay, so... <clears throat> So in uh, the uh, the seed for this, it's really, really important to pay attention to the behavior of uh, those communities that came before us and what their excessive questioning led to and how we are being told to not let um, that type of an attitude uh, deter us from the uh, submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is required um, in order to submit fully uh, in, in order to enter fully into the state of Iman that will benefit us in our um, life as well as in the Akhirah. So there's actually a report by Ibn Abbas عنه, where um, we have the description of the circumstances in which this particular verse was uh, was revealed. Okay, and uh, basically what happened is that it was a time when the Rasul وسلم, was in the company of some of the companions and this is reported on the authority of Ibn Abbas radiallahu an qala kana qawmun yas'aluna rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam istihza'an fa yaqul ar-rajul man abi wa yaqul ar-rajul tadillu naqatahu tadillu naqatuhu ayna naqati fa anzal Allah fihim hadhihi um hadhihi al-aya ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la tas'alu an ashya'a in tubda lakum tasu'kum hatta faragha min al-aya kulliha so here on the authority of Ibn Abbas, uh, uh, some people were asking the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about, um, you know, they were asking him questions, but they were asking him mockingly, astaghfirullah, yani, it was not befitting of the adab uh, that was due to our messenger uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So a man would say, who is my father? Uh, another man whose she camel had gone astray would say, where is my she camel? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse in this connection, this verse that we have right now. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la ta'asalu an ashya'a in tubuda lakum tasu'kum. Till the end of the verse. So Allah revealed this verse in this connection. O you who believe, ask not about things which if made plain to you would cause you, uh, would cause you trouble. So this was not um, appropriate adab with our messenger, uh, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And his purpose is to make the matters of the deen clear, right? This is why uh, he has been sent to make the matters of Islam, to make the matters of, um, uh, you know, religious um, uh, matters clear to us. It is not to answer uh, questions about who someone's father is or, oh, I lost my camel, where is my camel? Or to ask, you know, these types of uh, questions. They were to be avoided. This was bad, uh, considered bad adab. And, um, it was not something that, um, uh, especially after this incident, the Sahaba became very, very careful. Um, the Sahaba generally was not a culture. The Sahaba culture was not a culture where they would ask the Rasul a lot of questions. They were very uh, respectful. Uh, they had incredible adab with the Rasul. So Allah you know, generally most of the Sahaba and everybody became very careful after this um, incident. So they generally would not ask him, right? It was more an attitude of sama'na wa al-ta'na, right? That we hear and we obey. So um, here, uh, a note about what about asking questions about religious uh, matters? So actually we're not supposed to 
ask um, excessive questions, even within matters of the deen, okay? Um, so let alone, you know, other um, non-beneficial, unbeneficial questions. But even in matters of the deen, you're not supposed to ask, um, uh, you know, detailed questions, especially about hypothetical scenarios which have not occurred or uh, which have not been revealed, uh, um, revelation has not been revealed about them by Allah nor has the Rasul Sallallahu commented on them in any way. So um, it is not our place to then ask these hypothetical uh, questions. I mean, if Allah Subhanahu Wa has not mentioned something, why would we want to make things more difficult for ourselves by asking about it unnecessarily, even regarding something that has been revealed, but only that much has been revealed about it. Why would we delve into further questions and you know more questions just to make things more and more uh, difficult for us potentially so our attitude as muslims is if specifics are not mentioned we don't delve into further details because of this verse which is telling us that if um they were to be made clear to you and we'll just read the verse again in right? That if they were to be made clear to you, then they would actually harm you, right? It would, it would become burdensome to you. It would, be, it would make things more difficult um, for you. Um, and and after asking, then you become responsible for that knowledge, right? Then you become responsible for whatever that answer is, and you would have to then implement that. And that may be an overwhelming thing, right? That may become too overwhelming. So just don't go there. Um, leave you, you know leave it alone basically and um, recall what Bani Israel did um, when they were told to sacrifice the cow uh, you may be aware that Bani Israel had been exposed to various other cultures and uh, neighboring influences where the cow was a sanctified animal a revered respected animal and um, you know, there you know we just have cow worship, right? So um, they were influenced by this. So there was this reverence for the cow, and Subhanallah, look how they were tested um, by having to slaughter the cow, right? Um, so what what was their response? Um, what they did is that when they kept asking what kind of cow, what color of cow, asking for specs on the cow type. They weren't doing that to get clarification, to perfect the sacrifice for the sake of Allah with Ihsan and wanting to do it in the best way. They were trying to dodge having to do it all together. They were basically dodging the, they're trying to dodge the command. That's why they were asking all those uh, specifics. But what happened to them because of that questioning, they were driven to find exactly a very specific kind of cow that was then required as the only one that would satisfy those exact requirements. So they brought it upon themselves because obviously it's more difficult to find a specific type, type than a general type, right? So they made things more difficult for their own selves by this excessive delving into questioning this hair splitting. So, and you know, I know the quest, their questions appear to be for clarification or were confused as what type of cow it is. And, but again, it was not, um, uh, you know, motivated by wanting to observe Allah's commands perfectly. And the reason we know this is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, after they finished sacrificing the cow, فَذَبَحُوهَا وَمَا كَادُوا يَفْعَلُونَ Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 71. So they sacrificed it, though they were near to not doing it. They didn't want to do it. They would rather have not done it. And that's why they were asking all those questions. So you never ever want to be in a position, in a situation where you're asking questions, um, you know, thinking to, hoping to find some satisfactory answer that would then make you fulfill the commandment. That is the wrong attitude. And subhanAllah, it's become so prevalent. It's become almost like the norm in many circles where if we are not satisfied with the reasoning behind a commandment, why do I have to do this? Why is this haram? Why is this mandated? Why is this legislated? Why is this fault? Until we are not intellectually satisfied, um, we feel that is a justification to then not fulfill the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed all of the wisdoms of all of the things that he has commanded. He has not. 
We don't expect our parents to explain every single thing that they tell us to do. Um, it is very bad at the, for, for children, um, whether you are a grown child, adult yourself, or a young, younger person, very bad at the, to always ask and expect your parents to explain themselves uh, behind every command that they tell you or anything they ask you to do or tell you to do, etc. Very, very bad at the, uh, with your parents. So then how much more so with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So we should not be looking for uh, logical explanations for uh, you know intellectual reasoning behind every single command, and that if that is not provided, then uh, it's somehow uh, you know less appealing for me to have to do it. It's now less less binding on me um, to fulfill this command. No, it is not. It is just as binding. Um, so you could either do it and submit, or uh, you can resist, like Bani Israel tried to uh, resist. Um, now, the um, about the Bani Israel, um, you know, the last thing, you know, lesson learned is that um, excessive questioning will lead us to a tighter corner. It kind of corners us further and further into um, a more strict and specific requirement than what was originally mandated, right? Um, so just, you know, uh, Allah has forgiven those things which he has not mentioned by not mentioning them, so leave it at that, okay? Um, there was one footnote that I wanted to share from the Fasir uh, Maududi, rahimahullah ta'ala. I thought this was uh, insightful about um, forbid, having forbidden us to ask useless and unnecessary questions. He says, because some people used to put such questions to the Prophet وسلم, as were of the no practical good for mundane affairs, nor for spiritual uplift. Okay, so unnecessary questions. They're not helping them in their dunya or their akhirah, right? For example, once a certain person while sitting in a gathering asked, who is my real father? So there's a reference to the narration that we just shared. Likewise, sometimes some people put unnecessary questions concerning legal matters so as to get these defined, whereas they had been purposely kept undefined for the good of the people. Because when something is undefined and it has no flexibility, different people can apply it in different ways according to their situation and still have fulfilled the act. Whereas if you define it more and more legally, more and more technically, it becomes more difficult for a larger segment of the population to apply it in a more general uh, manner. Um, okay, the last thing that I want to quote from Tafheem on this was that there are certain things and commandments which have been left vague and without details. This is talking about the commandments of Islam. Sometimes, yes, some of the commandments are very general, but there's a wisdom to that and there's a mercy in that, right? It was not done uh, randomly. It was not done out of forgetfulness. Um, it was done purposefully, right? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as a mercy, has left these things vague and um, without having obviously forgotten anything because Allah does not forget. Um, so this is what Madud mentions next is this is not because the lawgiver had forgotten to give details or to make them specific, but because he did not intend to limit these in order to leave a wide scope for the people. Therefore, if a person goes on creating one issue after the other by putting unnecessary and useless questions and thus create limitations and specifications, he puts the people to unnecessary trouble. Likewise, if he tries to deduce the details by the force of his reasoning, quote unquote reasoning, and does not rest content till he has made the vague things specific and the indefinite definite, he in reality puts the Muslims in a very awkward position. This is because the more details we offer for the unseen and the next world, the more will be the chances for creating doubts about them. And likewise, the more limitations are imposed concerning the commandments, the greater will be the chance for their violation. Uh, incredibly wise commentary, insightful commentary on um, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has um, warned us of this attitude of excessive uh, questioning. Um, so another thing, um, this verse is saying, you know, you don't want to ask something about uh, what Allah has not mentioned, especially at the time that the Quran was being revealed, right? Because the verse says, 
يا ايها الذين امنوا لا تسالوا عن اشياء ان تبد لكم تسكم وان تسالوا عنها حين ينزل القران and if you ask about these things while the quran is being revealed because this is an active time of revelation when this verse came down obviously right in the time of the um, prophetic revelation right uh, in the time of the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam so if you're going to ask these questions while the quran is being revealed تبد لكم right then they will be made uh, clear to you right Um, so if you should ask about them what the Quran is being revealed, they will be made manifest uh, to you. So and this might result in uh, possible restriction or additional prohibitions because of your question, which was not in place beforehand, right? Now here, um, there's a chapter, uh, an authentic narration uh, on the authority of Amr bin Sa'ad, radiyallahu an, where um, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna a'adham al-Muslimina fil Muslimin." جرمًا من سأل عن شيء لم يحرم على المسلمين فحرم عليه من أجل مسألته. Very very uh, important narration here where uh, Amr bin Sa'ad reported on the authority of his father that uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the greatest sinner among the Muslims is the one who asked about a thing, يعني from the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which had not been forbidden for the Muslims and it was forbidden for them because of his persistently asking about it. Okay, um, and by the way, this uh, hadith is under under the chapter which says respecting him sallallahu alaihi wasallam and not asking him unnecessary questions. It's a double, a twofold matter of adab to the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then also the um, grievous uh, sin and burden that this brings upon the question if he makes haram. Um, If something becomes haram because of his question that was not there uh, beforehand. What does this teach us? This teaches us that the spirit of the sunnah is towards ease. The spirit of Islam is towards ease and a natural practice of religion within the broad uh, guidelines uh, that have been revealed for the good of humanity. It's not a technical, highly legalized, highly specialized system that unfortunately did creep up later. Uh, into Islam, and this is why we have a lot of rigidity now. Um, when you know people f- feel the need to really get into uh, specific technicalities, and that often compromises the spirit of the religion. Um, and often, you know, it's just like you're trying to tick off boxes in terms of fulfilling uh, certain aspects versus really doing the act of worship naturally, according to the Sunnah, according to the Quran, in the spirit of love. Um, so, you know, this is why we have this, uh, this, the Sunnah steers away from tightness and difficulty. It steered towards ease and, you know, uh, keeping things uh, doable uh, for the people, you know, and, and we know this from the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this was his uh, demeanor. So, um, of course, now just to, to finish off, we, this does not apply to asking legitimate questions. This doesn't mean you can't ask valid questions about something the Quran has revealed about, let's say in a general sense, and you want to ask for clarification sincerely just to understand how to apply that thing and to implement that thing. So the spirit of the question, uh, the intent of the question changes completely the um, place that question has uh, and the way that question is perceived, right? It can go from being condemnable, discouraged to something that is um, recommended and encouraged, right? And is beneficial. So um, look at the motivation behind the asking and um, when you're asking and also look at, um, you know, its usefulness to your uh, deen and um, the effect that, you know, uh, it has on you that you want it to become something through which you become closer to a Lubbock. Uh, enhancing understanding of that um, in particular case or question. Um, so, Alhamdulillah, has forgiven us uh, many of uh, those things that are not um, revealed, that there is no legislation about, those things have been overlooked uh, for us. And there should not be audacity in the questioning either. Okay, so actually, this is kind of turn into a lecture from this verse about uh, the adab of questioning and the detrimental um, effects of um, a negative or wrong uh, questioning, right? Um, and it's important because the Quran talks about it because former communities that the Quran talks about fell into this uh, very um, blameworthy uh, style and attitude. Like the Yahud, for example, asked Musa al-Islam to send a... Um, 
uh, not Musa alayhi salam, they, sent, they asked our Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, excuse me, the Yehud of Medina asked our Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, to have a book revealed to them uh, in order for them to believe, right? This is in Surah An-Nisa, verse number 153, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala records this saying of theirs, يَسْأَلُكَ أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ أَن تُنَزِّلَ عَلَيْهِمْ كِتَابًا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ the people of the book now ask of you to have a book come down on them from the heaven. Another useless request, right? Where um, So the commentary on that is one of the odd demands which the Jews of Medina made to the Prophet وسلم, was that if he wanted them to accept his claim to prophethood, he should have them either witness a book descending from the heavens or that each one of them should receive a writ, any written command, from on high, confirming Muhammad sallallahu prophethood and the absolute necessity of believing in him. So asking these, you know, really um, crazy, unreasonable, wild demands as if they're entitled to them special <clears throat> revelation. Um, the last thing that we want to mention here is a beautiful narration from Bukhari, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala, about... Um, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really wants us to behave. What kind of, so he doesn't want us to behave in the way that's discouraged in this verse, right? From this excessive questioning. Um, <clears throat> now we have a narration that also speaks about that and includes a, a more general framework for how Allah wants us to behave, what he hates for us, what he has forbidden for us. So there are two levels. One is that of being forbidden those things which are haram that are mentioned in this narration that I'm about to share with you. And then there's another level of things that are um, mentioned in this narration that are makruh, okay? And it's directly related to, a part of it is directly related to what we're speaking about. So this is in Bukhari from the authority of Al-Mughira, radiallahu anhu, where the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ حَرَّ مَا عَلَيْكُمْ حُقُوقُ الْأُمَّهَاتِ وَمَنَ عَوَاهَاتِ وود البنات وكريها لكم قيل وقال وكثرة السؤال وإضاعة المال. It's, it's a very nice narration because it rhymes actually in Arabic. So the Rasul said, Allah has, or an Nabi, the Prophet said, Allah has forbidden you, number one, to be undutiful to your mothers. Allah has forbidden you to be undutiful to your mothers, to withhold what you should give or demand what you do not deserve and to bury your daughters alive. So these are the things that Allah has forbidden, okay? To be undutiful to your mothers, to withhold what you should give, to demand what you don't deserve, and to bury your daughters uh, alive. These things are in the haram zone. What about the makruh zone, right? La kariha, kariha from ikra or makruh are related to these, um, to the same word. Allah has disliked that you talk too much about others. You ask, ask too many questions or waste your property. Okay, so these are the things that Allah subhanahu wa hates. So um, this is actually one of those um, places where we want to go into a worthy tangent, which is what I call them, uh, worthy tangents, because this narration actually categorizes the haram and the makru acts, which means these are extremely harmful to our character and to our deen, and we need to steer clear far away from them, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us what Allah has made haram for us, what he, what he uh, hates is makruh, and therefore um, we know that these things must have incredible amount of harm to our deen and to our character, which is why uh, we need to stay far away from them. So this uh, narration serves as a mercy uh, for us and an immediate character enhancer uh, for us, right? Um, and we're gonna talk about some of them. Number one, to be unkind to mothers, right? Um, and you know, this narration subhanAllah um, is telling us, speaking to us of those things which are haram. And the first thing that is mentioned is uh, right? It's interesting how mothers have been singled out, right? Um, to be obviously to be dutiful to parents is haram. Other narration mentions uh, mentioned they, that is obviously haram. Uh, uh, to be unkind or disobedient to parents in general, obviously, is forbidden. Um, but here, the Rasul sallam, singled out uh, disobedience or unkindness to mothers because of the way, perhaps, how unkindness breaks.
I disconnected. I'm not sure exactly what the last thing you heard was, but I think it was along the lines of so just bear with me. I'm just going to recap for those of you that uh, may have missed that. Um, so the first thing that the Rasul Sallallahu tells us in this narration that we reported from Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala and the authority of Al-Mughira is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made for us a few things, one of which is ummahat, being unkind to mothers because of the way that this breaks uh, their hearts. And uh, you know, it is unjustified to break anyone's heart, especially that of your uh, mother. And, you know, the only thing that they want from us is kindness. We can't do for our mothers what they did for us ever, obviously, right? They're not expecting that, that. they're not asking for that. But what they do need from us is our constant kindness, our attentiveness to them when we're in their company, uh, to be loving, to be uh, respectful, you know, just to let them know that, yes, I cannot do for you what you have done for me, but um, I can uh, be kind, I will be kind, and I will be loving, and I will be uh, respectful, okay, so this is something we definitely want to steer clear, when we have that attitude, we stay far and clear from ever hurting them, which is being unkind to them, which is which is one of the biggest uh, sins, right, and I was thinking, subhanAllah, how when we are young, um, nothing makes our mothers smile more than when her baby smiles, right? Everyone waits for that moment uh, when the baby is smiling so they can take that picture and just become so overjoyed uh, with that uh, smile that the baby gives, right? So um, now it's our turn to make them smile, right? Uh, our uh, smile and happiness meant the world to them and gave them um, happiness in their hearts. And now that we are older, we want to make them smile as much as uh, possible. And um, we want to become a cause of their happiness in their older age, now that we are adults and in a position to bring them comfort and help and assistance and they are in need of our help and assistance, even if they are still relatively young and healthy. There's so many ways that we can uh, continue to help our parents and more than the actual physical help, which of course is a big help, um, is the comfort that a mother or a parent gets in their heart by knowing that the child cares about the parent and is sympathetic to the amount of work they have and don't want them to do it alone um, or are willing to listen to uh, their mom when she wants to talk or your father when they want to talk, right? Um, so not just to physically help them, but to be there to, you know, uh, speak to them, to um, hear their concerns, to, to, to take them seriously, right? All of these things really um, strengthen the heart of parents as they grow older. And um, it makes them feel like the children are a source of moral support, a stronghold they can kind of rely on. Um, and this is the best feeling for a parent. So if we can somehow do that, um, then subhanAllah, there's nothing better. Um, there's nothing better um, than that. And then just watch the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descend down upon us. Watch the barakah that will come from that treatment of our uh, parents. And we all know the hadith of Uwais al-Qarni, which we're not going to get into right now. Um, the other things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in this narration, we're not going to do all of them, uh, that he hates for us is qila wa qal. So the first few things were those things that are haram or forbidden. And we spent a little bit of time talking about ukukul umahat, being unkind to mothers, which is one of the haram things. Now, then the uh, hadith mentions other haram things and then goes into those things that are makru or hated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates for you is qila wa qal, right? Is speaking too much about other people, speak, speaking of things that do not concern you. He said this, she said that, he was wearing that, he likes that, she can't stand that. You just gossip. Um, things that are not beneficial, things that are not helping your dunya or akhira, things that are none of your business. Okay, now why is why does Allah hate this? I mean, can, can I even talk now? I mean, some of us might be thinking, right? Um, so remember, Allah subhanahu wa only loves good for you. He wants paradise for you. He created paradise for us. So he forbade all of the things that lead to the fire, for sure. 
And he hated the things that can potentially lead to the fire as well. Like talking too much about others can easily lead to backbiting, a major sin. And then where would we be, right? With the burden of a major sin. Um, and also it is when you speak excessively about others, it is wasting time that could have otherwise been spent in earning his paradise that he has created for us and wants us to enter. So Allah doesn't like us to do anything that distracts us from earning his Jannah. And so he hates these things for us. He didn't make them haram out of mercy for our weaknesses, but at the same time, he's really totally discouraged them by hating them, right? Um, so that's where he wants to see you. He wants to see you in his paradise. So we shouldn't think like, oh, now I can't even talk. You know, why does he hate uh, me doing this? And what's wrong with talking? No, think about what we are saying. Think about the point that we are making, right? Most of us would agree with the concerns um, about backbiting and wasting time um, that are there when you speak too much about other people. And also the other great danger is that you become more focused on other people rather than your own self with excessively talking about others. There's this clear danger very easily we can fall into of being focused on others more than we are focused on our own uh, selves, right? So this is another huge disadvantage of qila wa qal. Qila wa qal, he said this, she said that, this and that. So I have to worry about improving my own self. When I point a finger at another person, uh, three fingers are pointing to me, right? So I need to be mindful uh, of that. And remember, Allah gave us two ears to listen, one tongue to talk, right? So we need to listen to his reminders and talk less of uselessness, right? <laughs> Okay, and then um, the next part of the narration, which speaks about what is makru or hated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is exactly related to our verse, which is why we narrated this uh, hadith. Gatrat al-su'al, excessive questioning. So uh, here the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in his uh, hadith is actually reinforcing what the Quran has already revealed, what this verse is, uh, has already stated, right? Um, excessive question. He hates excessive question. And we have seen why uh, in the brief explanation of the verse, why he would hate that for us. Again, it's something, uh, it is a mercy for us that he would hate for us through our excessive questioning to make things harder than they have to be. And then those hardships would overwhelm us so we wouldn't be able to uh, maintain the required level and that would equal more trouble. So here, kasat al-su'al, kasat al-su'al, excessive questioning, uh, beware of an attitude of challenging and questioning. And this is more directly related to our American context, our American culture, um, where it is encouraged to challenge everything. And it's good in the field of scientific inquiry and research and investigations. Um, th that attitude serves those domains very well, but it does not serve the domain of religion and deen because that is revealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if as believers, we uh, accept um, and submit to Allah and his perfect knowledge and wisdom, then after that, how can there be questioning of that knowledge and wisdom, right? Um, so it's, yes, it's praiseworthy, it's recommended, it's productive in um, science and research to be skeptical even and to question and to have trials and retrials and all of that. Um, but we make a mistake when we let the culture of science and technology, which is the um, most, uh, you know, uh, admired and, um, you know, um, the thing that has the highest status and weight culturally, uh, socially in our minds. Uh, we can't let um, that come into the domain of religion. So we have to keep our attitudes separate and clear. Uh, yes, that works in uh, science. It does not work in religion. So as a good Muslim who believes in the science Allah has revealed, uh, but also revealed, uh, believes in the religion he has revealed, um, will question the experiment, but not the uh, Lord of the worlds, right? Um, so if we have this clear in our mind, then there's really no conflict. There's, we don't have any conflict uh, with science. Um, so remember, um, also this is... Um, an attitude 
uh, that we also, uh, because of our culture where questioning is encouraged, uh, resisting is encouraged, uh, skepticism is encouraged because of this culture that we have, we sometimes also apply this to our parents. And uh, that is another domain that it does not work well in. It's not because we've been told to obey our parents. That's uh, that directive is completely opposed to this attitude of questioning, this culture of skepticism, right? Uh, so again, that domain is not uh, for question. The parental domain and the divine domain are not domains in which we um, apply the influences of our uh, otherwise culture of uh, questioning and reasoning everything out uh, by you know challenging it. Um, so instead of um, when our parents saying something, instead of questioning it, you got to remember a couple of things, right? Um, number one, remember they have decades more experience than you, and I'm speaking obviously to the younger audience. Um, part of respecting them is trusting them and trusting their judgment, not to brush it off because you think you know better, because you think they don't understand you because times are different now, because they're not in tune with the times, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is true for every generation. Every generation feels that way. And it's true. There are certain things that, uh, you know, we know that our parents don't know, et cetera, uh, technologically speaking. But the fact that they have more experience than us and the fact that they want the best for us more than we want it for our own selves, no one has your best interest in mind the way you're parents do, right? That's why regardless of the changing times um, and every generation of children, like we says, technologically ahead of their parents, but that, and Allah knows all of these things, obviously, all of that did not change Allah's decree, which is he has decreed to obey your parents. That decree is in place till the end of time. And we shouldn't obey them grudgingly, okay? Um, and this attitude of submission and obedience uh, we owe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we owe it to our parents and those that are in charge, um, right? So we should not do it grudgingly. And all of us obviously fall into these mistakes. We all fall into these attitudes, but to quickly realize and try to change, not to fall into a behavior pattern that is consistently disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Um, and remember, Bani Israel, they eventually did listen, right? To Musa alayhi they eventually did slaughter um, the cow, but look how it's mentioned in the Quran. Look how that act of worship that was supposed to be an act of worship was supposed to be an act of bringing them closer to Allah, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? It could have been that, but because of the way they did it, they did it. They actually physically slaughtered that cow. But they, because of the way they did it, the intentions they had, they'd rather not do it, the resistance, um, the questioning, you know, in trying to dodge having to do it. What, how did, uh, what did that result in? It resulted in Allah mentioning their act in not a praiseworthy way, but he kind of called them out for it, right? Um, that they sacrificed it, but they were near to not doing it, you know? So, I mean, does is it worth it? Is it worth it to spend all our energy um, to have create all this negative energy inside of us and resisting Allah's commands, even if we do them, they almost don't count, right? You don't want to fall into that. Um, so that's why the stories are there for our, uh, as warnings, so we don't fall into the same, um, you know, psychological traps, same, same attitude mistakes that former communities uh, did and lose credit for those acts, lose reward for those um, acts, right? You want to do it lovingly and trustingly, right? You want to obey Allah lovingly and trustingly. You want to obey your parents lovingly and trust in me, even if it is hard, like Ibrahim alayhi salam, right? You have the example of Bani Israel and how they slaughtered the cow, and you have the example of Ibrahim alayhi salam and how he almost slaughtered his son, right? Um, but because of, you know, it's like, subhanAllah, if you think about it, it's like Bani Israel did the slaughter, but Allah says it's almost like they didn't, you know, uh, they were near to not doing it, almost like they didn't do it, right? Um, and Ibrahim alayhi salam was ready completely to submit and had all the right, you know, attitude of submission and wanting to labay at Allah's command. And then what happened? He didn't need to slaughter Ismail, right? He almost slaughtered him, but didn't need to, subhanAllah. Um, 
So th- these are some of the blessings that come with fully trusting Allah. These are some of the blessings that come with going to Allah's commands with a with full trust in Him, with full trust in the wisdom behind His commands, without resistance but with submission. When you go to Allah's commands with that attitude, then look at the blessings that result. Look at how Ibrahim alayhi salam I'm going to make you uh, for all humanity an imam. Ibrahim alayhi salam, the only one who is, uh, you know, acknowledged by all faith traditions. An imam, a leader for all of humanity, for all faith traditions, um, Islam, um, Judaism, Christianity, right? So the blessings are then um, beyond what we can imagine. And the last thing is, uh, in the, from the hadith is man, right? And the same narration that we're talking about today. To be wasteful in your wealth. The spirit of Islam, as you can glean by now, is against wastefulness of any kind. And it's very interesting how all the things that are makruh here, right? Um, what is that? Speaking too much about others. Yani being wasteful in your speech, being excessive in your speech. Islam steers away from that. Um, then you have being excessive or wasteful in your questioning. Too many questions, not good. Steer away from that. And the last thing is being wasteful, excessive in your spending. Okay, so we see Islam as a religion of moderation and that moderation sometimes is um, not a good translation because it's really about optimization. Okay, it's not moder- moderation may not be a fully accurate term that conveys the full sense of the Islamic dictates between excess and deficiency, between uh, going overboard and becoming uh, extreme and overwhelm yourself um, versus falling short and being deficient and not even fulfilling your fara'id. Between that, there's an optimal path. Okay, we often call it the moderate path or the middle way, but I think a better way to understand it is the optimal path. Okay, this optimal path is what um, gives you the full opportunity for ihsan, right? So it's optimization, uh, really, uh, that Islam uh, dictates. And so, obviously, talking too much or questioning too much or wasting your wealth is not an optimization of your resources of your abilities, whether they are of speech or of uh, intellectual reasoning or of financial ability, right? Um, Why can't I have the brand name even if I give in charity? Sometimes we ask this question, why can't I just have that brand name bag um, if I've given in charity? Well, it's because that item is just not worth that crazy price tag. You can get a fine bag at a reasonable price and the rest can be shared that you would have spent on that brand name, the rest of that wealth could instead go towards plenty of other people that are still left over after you've written out that uh, original check to charity, right? Um, so really, you know, balancing or our, our, our checking our own desires and making sure that it's not only, you know, ourselves that are enjoying when my financial position can make life a little more enjoyable or a little less distressful uh, for others around the world. So to always have that sensitivity that I could have been in this situation, right? So this is an optimization of our financial abilities, which translates into infinite rewards and the akhirah. That's what Allah wants for us. All of these guidelines, all these ahkam, um, and subhanAllah, I had no idea I was going to spend the entire session on just one verse today. Um, but subhanAllah, it really speaks to us about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to optimize our resources, right? Uh, everything that he has given us, our ability to talk, our ability to use our minds, our financial wealth. He wants us to use these optimally in order to uh, walk that path of ihsan, which will bring us the greatest rewards of the next life by his permission and grace. And this is why he has forbidden certain things and hated for us certain things because they take us away from that potential for optimization. Okay, so with that, we will actually stop here, inshallah, a few minutes early, just because I think it's uh, uh, right time to uh, stop, inshallah. And 
um, we'll continue tomorrow. We'll be back here at uh, 4 p.m. for our session tomorrow um, from continuing Surah Al-Ma'idah. If anyone has any questions or comments, please feel free to uh, leave them, um, inshallah, in the, in the chat. Um, take care. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Enjoy a healthy iftar. And please remember us and the Muslim Ummah in your du'as. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.